word is satisfied one of my addictions today. <laughs> you fed me. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Enjoy me to your thanks to uh, the very important supporters of uh, Mary's program here, but particularly this uh, uh, visiting program of uh, curators at uh, your graduate school. So thank you, Mrs. and, and Mr. Goldberg, for doing this. There are very few uh, patrons who think of supporting curators, so I thank you very much. It's very important. Lots of support usually goes to artists and not to the people who support the artists. So, um, and of course, uh, I also thank Council uh, College, Howard, and the entire team, the people of the Artist Institute, Jenny, and uh, the lady who actually initiated the entire conversation from the beginning is not here today, Andrea Bloom. Yes, yeah. in Paris. Yeah. We'll an exhibition. Great. <laughs> That's what artists should do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you very much for that. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me always to be in, a, in an educational setting and share knowledge and share practice and share experience that uh, support, accompany, uh, frame uh, artistic thinking and curatorial practice in any given space. Um, the, the title or sort of the framework of, uh, of my visiting professorship or visiting curatorialship, I must say, in the, in the, in the, at Hunter College. Uh, when, I, when I got the invitation from the program to be one of the visiting curators and uh, following the steps of so many illustrious uh, colleagues that have been here before me. Um, I think every invitation for us at Raw Material Company prompts us to not only, of course, honor the call, but also push the ideas a little bit further or frame it in a, in a sense that makes sense to us in our practice, but also that, cons that cons uh, uh, consistently and substantially augment in a, in a, in a, in a, in a meaningful way the, the kind of experience that we can provide, the kind of collaboration that we can initiate, and the kind of knowledge that we can produce and share together. So, uh, I know. I knew that this program uh, has always been designed around curators coming to you and working with you and staying here and being fed by 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 Hunter College and the, and the uh, MFA program and being fed by New York and so on and. Uh, that for us it became a moment of uh, reflection because one of the things that uh, is very essential in our practice is where we are. So bringing us to New York uh, was a little bit of a, uh, a difficult matter and uh, at the same time we were, we thought about what is it that our practice really makes sense in the context of, uh, of a program such as uh, the curatorial certificate program at Hunter and the, the, the studio <coughs> practice program, the art history uh, department. And we came to the realization that um, me coming to New York for two weeks and running seminars here uh, would be just a proxy, kind of like I would never bring everything to New York. Um, 
So in order to expand that possibility and in order to provide a better grasp and a better understanding, so I told Andrea and, uh, and uh, Howard, listen, I mean, uh, this is the context in which Fred will put it, but this is what I offer. Why, why not, instead of me coming to New York, why don't you come to the car? <laughs> so Howard uh, swallowed twice, <laughs> kind of like, <laughs> okay, how would you want to do that? So it took three years to develop and to bring it to what we have today. And I really want to commend you on that and thank you for uh, doing the exercise uh, together because it's not always obvious and uh, natural that you can sort of shift certain institutional practices. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I will be talking today uh, around the theoretical analytical framework that I'm placing my my uh, my visit here, and uh, and how that framework would play out around uh, two three different stations. One of the stations is today uh, that I spent already this morning. Uh, speaking with graduate students and uh, this lecture tonight. And the, the next phase is uh, the sort of mini summer school that we are holding in the car in September for, for a week. And then the last phase will be in January where uh, the team of raw material company will come to New York for a three-day symposium and seminar or co-organizing, co-fought with the participating uh, students. So, let me begin. I'm not such a good or such a good freestyle speaker, so you bear with me. I will be reading a little bit. And uh, a sense of place. Some places have presence. No, actually, all places have presence. The question is how the presence of all of the places' component parts may be cultivated and supported and to what extent energies born from historical connections and confrontations are left latent or are allowed to flourish in order to make sense of this presence. In Dakar, there are many places that have presence, and the place is understood as being a far deal more than square meters within a special <coughs> three-dimensional delimitation. But for many people in Dakar, their relationship to place is shifting as it is across much of the planet. Climate disaster is rapidly reshaping the contours of our physical environments, and resurgent right wing is making claims on the rights of human movement in a manner that recalls some of the 20th century's darkest moments. It is with greater urgency that as individuals and institutions, we examine the relationality of how we inhabit, not only occupy, the various sites across which we move, we move, and still we move and still and stand still. This leads us to think about how, as curators of an institution, we may make the presence of a place visible and how we may work with a resolute, a resolute sense of place. A task made all the more pressing, fueled by the knowledge that in so many instances, institutions, artistic and cultural or otherwise, have historically worked to quash the truths of the place. Inseparable from this endeavor, 
is the necessity of asking questions around the politics of presence and access. In a bid to share the guiding lines of how I have in my work approached these issues, I will talk this evening about institution building as curatorial practice. Thus referring to the note to a notion that has been a preoccupation of mine for over a decade now, both in my work as an independent curator and in the context of the development of Raw Material Company, the Center for Art, Knowledge and Society based in the car etc. So you see the front of Raw in the background. And of which I'm the founding artistic director and very recently as Howard said, I've been appointed director of what could be considered the, the biggest museum of contemporary art in Africa. And uh, I'm just transitioning from size to size. <laughs> and from, as I like to say, from one window of the continent to another window of the continent because I like extremes. So the car, the car is at the most south most western point of the continent, looking at the Americas, and Cape Town is at the most southern point of the continent. So there is a good conversation between the two cities, at least geographically. RAW was founded in 2008 as first a mobile concept, and was then established as a physical space in 2011. As our, as our curatorial practice and the scope of our work has grown, so has also my interest in the way that art institutions encapsulate and act on, a different, on different forms of curating. In line with the proposition by Aminata Draman Traoré, the Malian economist, social scientist, and major patrons of the arts in Bamako, the line that Africa must recover the immaterial part of herself, that which feeds her imagination, I am convinced that art institutions are not only products of the environments, but also active and invaluable agents capable of shaping their societies in return. So in this talk, I will discuss some of the similarities that exist amongst art institutions that have emerged in Asia, Africa, and in the Middle East, and South America over the past 15 years or so, and that have contributed to the way I understand and shape the work at Raw Material Company. I also want to think about the impact those institutions have had on ways of understanding the role of the curator before looking in depth at how Raw uses those uses programming to produce the symbiosis between its existence as an institution, in, particular, in a particular place, and its curatorial practice. So a quick introduction of the genesis of Raw Material Company is perhaps necessary at this point for those of you who are not familiar with what we do, which I guess is most of the audience. In 2008, Dakar, situated on the African continent's most western point, could boast of a relative dynamism in terms of artistic action and intellectual production. The city being best known in the art circles for the biennial that we host since the early 90s. In the, in the, in the 20 years following its independence that happened in 1960, Senegal had a centralistic model of state-led cultural production, a sort of a hangover from the French colonial period and reinforced under the president poet Leopold Sidar Senghor. The structural adjustment programs of the 1980s, however, brought an end to state, to, to state support and while the cultural arms of international diplomacy and a small number of collectors contributed to the art scene, this led in general to a significant shift in style and content that was tailored towards the top-down goals of international development and a misplaced 
and deformed notion of what traditional African art should be. So what's more, by the early 2000s, there was no formal space to address theoretical ideas around contemporary artistic production. And I was becoming frustrated with having to apologize to international visitors for the dearth of such spaces. Raw material was thus born out of the necessity to create a space for sharing knowledge, a place that would provide access to contemporary artistic theory, and in return generate discourse, ideas, and practice. And as all Africans know, which you all are, because we all come from there, the fact, the act of naming is of the utmost, utmost importance. What I didn't want was a name that featured contemporary. We also didn't want a name that featured art, and certainly not a name that featured African. So raw material company does has several significations. Referring to Africa as historically providing raw materials for global industries, but also to art and intellectualism as raw material for human development. Company, at last, stands for both an entrepreneurial approach to artistic production as well as a collaborative sense of togetherness. I will come back to our program a little bit later. It is important to note here, what is important to note here is that Raw Material Company emerged at the same time as a significant number of other private, non-commercial art centers away from the epicenters of the Western art world. My curatorial engagement with this phenomenon was made particularly potent when in 2009, I was invited by Sir David Ajay to create the contemporary section of Geographics in Brussels, a map of African art past and present. To the, in the context of the celebration of 50 years of African independence at the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels. I was growing more and more wary of curating exhibitions, and I was not interested in doing another lining up of, of the usual suspects that have been widely promoted over the last 15 years or so. So in my thinking, I would gravitate towards the question of how the continent of Africa, after 50 years of independence of the great vast majorities of its country, how the continent is really determining its artistic, artistic landscape. I figured that independent art institutions have altered and shaped the art scene a great deal, and in so and so. Instead of inviting living artists, inviting artists to do a show, I invited seven art institutions, <coughs> including Appartement 22 in Rabat, Morocco, Dar 1718 in Cairo, in Egypt, CCA Lagos, Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos, in Nigeria, and many others to present their models, their strategies, and their ideas in progress. So the art institutions became the artworks. Carlos told me that I have to wait because this is the like, oh, <laughs> Good. So while art centers and different art institutions in the Western world have been buckling under the strain of budget cuts. This is something that we all know. It's always different in different places. More and more seem to be opening in the rest of the world. These spaces set themselves apart from state-affiliated institutions and the commercial art market. 
with many of them addressing an artistic and critical void in their local environments. Some aim to establish self-organized, non-hegemonic and experimental fields, such as Crater Invertido in Mexico City, who function on a collaborative workshop model. Some are deliberately questioning institutions established by the post-colonial state, and many try to fill in where the public se sector has floundered. Dollar Art in Cameroon, for example, was founded in 1991 in direct response to inadequate legislation on freedom of association in the country. Sud, the Salon Urbain de Douala, its triennial festival is a platform for experimentation and intervention in the urban space of Douala and a proposition for new forms of citizenship. In an exciting term that at Raw, we passionately encourage new forms of South-South cooperation and transcontinental networking, including diasporic communities, are in development. We are, for example, part of Arts Collaboratory, an horizontally organized, collectively run funding network that includes some 25 independent art centers situated in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. You will note that Europe and America and Canada are not part of it. It has a reason. In this sense, these art centers and the new synergies they produce through collaboration are going a long way towards demystifying imperial legacies of geography as we work together on both practical decision and artistic projects. Despite inevitable vari variations of specific cultural settings and social cultural parameters, the core urgencies of these spaces bear the same motives and are unbound by geographical definitions. They embrace a diversity of practices and are complicating Western assumptions about what authenticity means with regards to regionality. Context and relativity are tools imperative for these centers in organizing new flows of ideas and production. These are art centers that, uh, these art centers are spaces of proximity that know their audience intimately and are therefore well positioned to engage deeply with the environment. Cameroonian curator Simon Jami, by no coincidence, the artistic director of the Dakar Biennial 2016 and 2018, argues that the creation of these spaces is therefore, quote, a political gesture that proclaims the primacy of the people over the state apparatus, end of quote. In tandem with the growth of the growth in independent art institutions away from the West, there, are also, there, are, there, are, there has also been a notable shift in understanding what a curator does and their role in the society. Today's curators working in an independent art center in Dakar, in Medellin, or in Jakarta, does far more than what which is framed by the norms of contemporary art. It is thus at this point constructive to pose on the term curating in itself, because everybody is a curator today. So we have to defend kind of our profession and our titles since we are not protected. <laughs> The tropes of the international contemporary art world, with its close ties to market mechanisms and the strictures of academia, do not necessarily leave the space for thinking deeply about artistic practices on the African continent. We must also remain attentive to the linguistic precision, as in raw, 
We are working in a country where the official language is French, but where the most widely spoken language is Wolof, all the while heavily anglicized by the overall imperialism of English as the lingua franca of contemporary art. In the Cambridge English Dictionary, the verb to curate is equated with a process of selection. In Rafa Niemoyevsky's essay, The Aspirational Narrative of the New Curator, he guides us through the overuse of the term referring to curated hotels, to curated shop windows, to curated menus, to curated workouts, to curated playlists, and so on, and so on. In French, the parameters of the term are tighter. There is no verb for curating or to create. One is a commissaire, or on those commissariat. Mm -hmm. So, but the commissaire is someone who is responsible for a commission. There is clearly a disparity between the two definitions. I would have loved to be able to decline this in Russian, Japanese, and, and Spanish, and so on, but I leave it at French and English. So there is clearly a disparity between the two definitions. And we see how in the English language, curating has become an umbrella term for an ever larger host of different activities centered around selection. Whereas in French, the connotations are with either the police or they suggest a somewhat theological economic exchange, <laughs> which if you put both together, we sort of come to what some of us do. <laughs> this is not befitting to what raw material does at all. So let's go further into the etymology of the word. Niemoyevsky highlights the Latin roots of the term curate, curare, meaning to care for, which we all know. While this meaning is inextricably tied to the historical role of curator as caretaker and protector of a particular collection, its connotations are given new life in today's social, political, and artistic climate, where the urgencies of defending sites of criticality and dreaming press, us all, press upon all, us all. So maybe this is more akin to what we do at Raw Material Company. Our curatorial practice is our way of caring for society and its, and its citizens to ensure its health and vitality. Let's see if it works. Oh. This is a very nice picture that I love and uh, with my ear whisperer, the artist is the sound. Here I would like to pause as one cannot talk about raw material company without pointing out the work of the renowned artist Issa Sound, a Senegalese painter, sculptor, performance artist, playwright, and poet, and much more, who, has <coughs> who was one of the pioneering members of the Laboratoire Agita, a collective, one of the first artist collective ever on the continent created in the very early 1970s. Sam was an artist who openly criticized, criticized the ideology of negritude as put forward by President Senghor, and who also realized early on the necessity for artists to create their own independent spaces and initiatives. When I arrived in Senegal 24 years ago, after a prior short visit, 
One of the first people I was introduced to was Issa Sam. Back then, he was performing one of his Plekhanov theater pieces in celebration of fellow founder of the laboratoire, the playwright Yusuf Adjian, who had just passed away. It was such an inspiration for me and for the best introduction imaginable to what was happening in the Senegalese context. There is always a feeling of strangeness and excitement when you touch a new ground. It becomes important to have people who will welcome you, show you the way, make you feel at home. That's what Issa did for me and continued so for two decades. Laboratoire Ajita paved the way for different generations of artists and building a bed, uh, shape for shaping, sorry. The laboratoire paved the way for different generations of artists and citizens who have been deeply invested in shaping, reshaping, and building a better society in which art and culture can gain due recognition and consideration and it's necessary to think about raw material company in relation to that legacy. This need to think about processes of curation of artistic practice that go further, that take into account methodologies of societal and whose interests are higher, are neither commercial nor purely aesthetic, has pushed me and raw material to engage with new undervalued creative practices. We are forced to think about what, what skills and knowledge people have that come from outside of the academy or, or mainstream art world, but that already do or have the potential to contribute to our artistic ecosystem and beyond this, the society at large. We have been inspired by the work of collabor collaborators such as Chimorenga, the Pan-African platform for writing, art, and politics with the, which directed the second session of our academy program and would deliberately stretch boundaries. Chimorenga was also, is also the recipient of the, this year's Verilis uh, Award for uh, social practices and arts and politics, and they will be in, at Parsons in the fall. Don't miss them at all. If you, as soon as you, you get the information, just go. Don't even think. <laughs> as they so beautifully put it, quote, unless we push forms and content beyond what exists, then we merely reproduce the original form, the colonized form, if you will. It requires not only a new set of questions, but its own set of tools, new practices and methodologies that allow us to engage the lines of flight, of fragility, the precariousness as well as joy, creativity and beauty that defines contemporary African life today. So, end of quote. The questions thus become, how might raw material company produce a symbiosis between its existence as an institution and its engaged curatorial practice? As I have shown, the two are not mutually exclusive but rather conducive to developing and supporting new forms of artistic practice that intervene in society. A Red Pearl as a self-reflexive institution that operates around seven main pillars of activity, all centered in their own way on artistic research and critical thinking. These activities constitute a practice that cont contributes to the local artistic environment of raw material, but that equally nurture the development of our practice through the close ties to its public, new theoretical propositions, and the building of a local international network. I have to do this quicker. Sorry, I'm an IT idiot. 
So for the first five years of our existence, we pursued an intense program of exhibition making. As you can show, see here from a selection of our uh, posters. These exhibitions include Fed Comme Chez Vous, or Make Yourself at Home, that presented the work of 11 international artists and artist groups whose practice addresses the notion of hospitality. Another exhibition we worked on is Chronicle of a Revolt, a timely document of a season of intense political and social activity that led to the peaceful democratic outcome of 2012 presidential election in Senegal. Here I have to pause and give you a little bit more background. So in 2010, 2011, 2012, there was what went down in history as uh, the, uh, uh, the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in that context, the entire language, not to diminish, of course, the, 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 the push and the revolts and the revolution for, for freedoms that, uh, that uh, were uh, going on in those countries, but the entire geopolitical language was uh, to sort of detach the, the, the movement from the African continent. So calling it the Arab Spring was seen from, from our perspective was a, a way of undermining the connections of those countries to, 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 to Africa. So if you look at what is so-called the Arab world, of the 22 countries that officially speak Arabic as an official language, uh, more than half of them are on the African continent. Uh, the spark of the what is called the, the Arab Spring was in Tunisia, swapped over to Egypt, still on the African continent. So just to give you a little bit of context. So it was for me not an Arab Spring, it was an African Spring. Hollandais investigated the complex relationship between the Netherlands and Africa in the context of colonization and decolonization via the distinct fabrics known as Hollandaise or Dutch wax that are widely worn in West Africa and are very often concerned and, and uh, associated to Africanness. Whereas, there is nothing African to those fabric. It's a pure product of post-colonialism and trade routes. Alongside, alongside exhibition making, raw material has since, in, since its inception been committed to archiving the knowledge production that emerges through our programs and contributing to a discursive field uh, we are engaged in. We have therefore produced almost a dozen of publications since 2011, which allow us to reflect on a deep level on our work, to open those conversations to a wider audience and create new sources for artistic research. Our investment in reading and writing is also manifested in our library that is specialized in contemporary art and that is the only one that exists in the car in that form. With over 2,000 works, we have also established a book club that aims to activate the resources in our library through lively public discussion. Uh, it is a program that we internally call Perform the Library because the idea, the idea of uh, having a library where people come and consult publication and do research is, uh, is too narrow for us. And we think that knowledge that is contained in a, in, a, in a library such as ours should be, particularly when it's artistic knowledge, should be performed in a manner that is active, that is lively. So our, our, our performance and uh, uh, book club activities are part of that endeavor. 
Roy is also home to a residency program and I strongly advise you all to apply. Mm -hmm. We have multiple residencies that are, that are very attractive to all of you. And since 2011, we have welcomed over 40 practitioners from a variety of creative fields. These artists, writers, curators, researchers, filmmakers, architects spend two to six weeks in Dakar where they undertake research and participate in cross-cultural exchange by bringing a fresh gaze to our work and the landscape we inhabit always and an enriching process for us and for them. Raw has since has had since its inception a pan-African vocation, nurtured by collaborations and exchange with artists and artists' initiatives on the continent and elsewhere. We strongly believe that mobility is core to our practice and give the opportunity to artists and art professionals to be more informed about the given context. Not only important to artists, the residencies have also been a way for us to learn from the artists coming to visit us and work with us and deepen our understanding of the complexities around us. So various examples have shown us the importance of a new voice, an ex exterior eye, and the impact of new perspectives can have on our practice and context. So, residents like Zen Marie, a South African artist and thinker and critic, Monila Al Kadiri, Kuwaiti artist who may be familiar with some of you uh, in New York because she has shown that more recently, and Tuan Andrew Nguyen, amongst others, have shown in different ways the importance and value of exchange and collaborative exploration. This is um, Nira during her public lecture, during her time as a resident at uh, Roman Tico Company. Monira Al Kadiri, a Kuwaiti artist whose father was a diplomat on posting in Dakar where she was born. The family were left when she was still a baby. Through her application to the residency program 35 years later, she had the opportunity to come back to Dakar, her place of birth. Throughout her practice, Monera has been strongly looking into past memories and the way they affect the present. Ideas of identity, displacement, and belonging have had an important, play, important place in her work, and they took form through a video and performance pieces she created in collaboration with a young Senegalese musician. Zen Marie. Zen Marie is a South African artist with whom we have, we have worked multiple times since opening in 2011. When he contributed his first residency, he, he conducted his first residency with us doing research on the idea of circulation and navigation of cities, a project that he has developed in South Africa and India as well. Zen has been a resident at raw material in many qualities, as an artist, as an observer, as a faculty, and member of our study program, the Royal Academy, that I will explain later. During his most recent stint, Zen explored the history of an, of an uninhabited island located off the coast of Dakar, Ilo Sarpon. This island has a strong presence in the imaginary of the city, but is considered as a ghost. And many Senegalese people choose not to visit this, not to visit given the legends that it is attached to. It became a site for Zen to look into the idea of ghosts and hauntings, the absence of a present place, and looking at how, as people, we can relate to this.
Juan Antonuyen, a Vietnamese artist, former member of the Propeller Group, the Artist Collective, who works with video among other media. In his uh, practice, Tuan has been focusing a lot on the aftermath of colonization in different contexts and the way in which it has shaped different societies. Tuan came to Dakar in order to conduct research on the Vietnamese community that emerged in Senegal as a result of the war in Indochina that took place from 1946 to 1954 where the French army was largely made of soldiers from West Africa who were generically called the tirailleurs Sénégalais, the Senegalese infantrymen. Many of the thousands of soldiers who came back home from the war were accompanied by their spouses and children born out of the relationships with Vietnamese women. Even though we knew about the history and wanted to address it, we at Raw Material Company were not aware of the real problems faced by the community in terms of integration, belonging to a place, and the remnants of their own past struggles. Tuan's residency created a space of dialogue with the Vietnamese community in Senegal with whom we hadn't been able to engage with. And this is a, 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 a view of uh, the work that resulted out of the residency that Tuan uh, presented at the uh, still ongoing Shasha Baedio recently. Maybe some of you were there. It's a very touching, emotional work. I cried when I see it, when I saw it. Central to our program and commitment to fostering a close relationship to a diverse public is also Fridays at Rome, a constellation of weekly public events that offer a platform for reflection and debate around artistic and curatorial practice, architecture and urbanism, society and cinema. The program is built around four different thematic components and is organized in collaboration with local practitioners and specialists in the field. Vox Artists, for instance, is a privileged moment for artists to share their work with a diverse audience. It's a moment for artists because we strongly believe that as much as the exhibition is center stage in curatorial practice, the exhibition in itself is limited in terms of getting an understanding of artistic practice. So uh, the Vox Artists program is really a moment for us to provide a, 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 a space, a, a time for artists to get deeper in explaining, exchanging, sharing their, their practice in a, in, a, in a more kind of conversational, analytical, critical, depending on whatever form of engagement they are comfortable in engaging with, so as to provide uh, an understanding of what they are concerned with and what, how they do their work and how they present it. Parlons Sénégaliserie is another series of debates and discussions on Senegalese society. And Royal Cine Club is obviously a film screening followed by a panel discussion. And Cityology is a reflection of, on contemporary African city space through the prism of urban and architectural policy and politics. As part of our constant negotiation and play with different scales of relationality, being at once deeply rooted in the local context of Dakar and involved in trans-regional and continental networks, Raw Material Company has organized three symposia reflecting on, on the status of artistic and curatorial practice in Africa. Our symposia, known under the generic name of Condition Report, which most curators know what that is, has contributed to the emergence of new discourses 
and awareness in relation to the dynamics at play in the contemporary art landscape. In 2012, the symposium, our first inaugural symposium, Condition Report on Building Art Institutions in Africa, was the opportunity to focus on how independent institutions have contributed to shaping the field of contemporary art on the continent. This was followed by the second symposium on artistic education in Africa held in 2014, a moment to reflect on the status of the education of artists on the continent and the need to foster collaboration between private and public institutions. Condition Report 3 took place in September 2018, so quite recently, with a focus on art history in Africa and convened in collaboration with art historian and colleagues Muf Obuche Kunzewi, who would soon become the uh, curator at BOMA for African art. The most recent addition of the, to the raw material company uh, frame of programming is, as it were, is the Royal Academy. Increasingly convinced that we needed to do more for artistic education, which we found to be largely underwhelming or positively problematic in our region and further afield. The second condition report on artistic education allowed us to go a long way towards confronting the scope of both the issues and proposals that exist today. Wanting to fully develop our own education program, but restricted by the pressures of intense programming, we, decide, we decided to take an institutional sabbatical in 2015. So we are in an academic framework, so you all know what a sabbatical is. You know, usually sabbaticals are granted, given to faculty, and never to students. I don't ever understand why. Uh, uh, and sabbaticals are, are never given to institutions either. So if you understand the concept of the sabbatical, which is a moment of, uh, of uh, retreat, a moment of, uh, of reflection, a moment of rest and a moment of regeneration, we considered that art institutions deserve to take a sabbatical too. So this was also an exercise for us in remolding the limits of what institutions, their existence de dependent on staff and programming, can and cannot do for their own health and development. It was an act of protest against the imperatives towards incessant production that weighs on independent art centers and that is unfortunately all too decisive for gaining funding that is heavily weighed towards program by program financial opportunities. So we said stop, we are tired, this is too much and uh, we need to rethink we need to reassess our, our uh, activity, we need to refocus, we need to think what we, done, what we have done the last six years, what kind of impact it has, how can we, can, how can we uh, go forward, how do we want to go forward, and so on. So the sabbatical, the sabbatical was necessary for that. It was an... Oh. So for all, it was the opportunity to wholeheartedly focus on putting together the Raw Academy. Now, our most pivotal and intense uh, of our activities, actually our flagship program, to which you are also welcome to apply. <laughs> Raw Academy is an experimental residential program for the research and study of artistic and curatorial practice and thought. The program takes place over seven weeks in Dakar. It is dedicated to a dynamic reflection on artistic research, curatorial practice, and critical writing. The academy is held during two distinct sessions every year. 
One session takes place October to December. Another session takes place usually March, April to June. Each session is directed by a lead faculty who has displayed an off-the-beaten track practice in regards to art, curating, and art criticism. The academy is tuition-free. That's very important. It's for free. You don't have to pay. It's tuition-free, experimental study program, and fellows and fellows are newly graduates from art schools, curatorial programs, and various fields of the humanities. We admit a maximum of 10 fellows for each session. We consider that recent graduates or practitioners are at the early that are at their early stages of their careers are in an incredibly sensitive, vulnerable position. Often highly formatted by their education, their transition into the wider artistic ecosystem is rarely an easy one. As financial pressures and the fierce trends of the art world risk pushing them away from radical practice, it is also far too often the case that their network is limited to peers from their own discipline and they lack contacts that will help them to complete their own skill sets and who will nurture their individual strengths and perspectives. So we try to catch these future artists, critics, writers and art historians at this tender moment and to give them a space to interact with new ideas, points of view, and to put them into action together. Actually, to unlearn everything that they learned in their head. <laughs> Precious sessions have included, previous sessions of the academy have, this is one of the academy sessions, that, uh, uh, in the courtyard studio of uh, Sassam. Previous sessions have included Hunger Incorporated, directed by Beirut-based independent curator and critic Rasha Salti. We just five hands there. This was a dive into the close relationship between aesthetic production and political imaginary and reality notably through the medium of film. The second session of the Academy, titled Angazi but I'm sure, directed by the collective that I mentioned earlier, Chimorenga, that investigated and engaged on the on the sh on a practical level with the ways that knowledge is articulated, a challenge to what may be considered knowledge or creative practice, and a commitment to turn tuning into African epistemological frequencies. Session three of the Academy, with the title, The Five Elements, Hip Hop, Aesthetics, and Politics, which you now have made explored the role of hip-hop culture, the role that hip-hop culture has played in shaping society and politics across the globe, and in particular in Senegal, where it has had an enormous, uh, where it has on a no numerous occasion been instrumental in political change. The fourth session of the Academy, titled Corpus Callosum, directed by a groundbreaking South African video and performance artist, Tracy Rose, referencing the space of play and potential that can be drawn out of the left and the right brain. And this academy mined its possibility in dismantling binary oppositions, notably through performance practice. We were delighted to welcome Nigerian-born artist Otto Bonkanga as lead faculty for session five, titled Germination, that explores the notion of collaboration between human beings and nature 
and the notion of care. Session 6 of the Academy, titled Pura, that I had the honor and pleasure to direct myself, <laughs> was an attempt to reflect on and around curatorial practice through the trajectories and perspective of different individuals working across the planet. This image shows fellows before the remains of what was once a well-known mural in the Open Air Museum of Dakar's Medina. The Academy is therefore intended to be a moment of deep inquiry and reflection for all involved, from the selected fellows to the invited and lead faculty, and of course, for our organization itself. The daily life in the Academy goes from indoor sessions with seminars, discussions, public lectures, and site visits in Dakar and beyond. It has also generated strong relationships that continue through time. It is certainly what we are most motivated by. We have fellows that have become members of our team, fellows that from their time abroad and in the city of Dakar decided to settle in Senegal there and fellows that became close collaborators of invited faculty members. What's more, our programming staff has, are deeply involved in both the running and the day-to-day -day experience of the academy, which allows us to constantly reevaluate our own approach to curating and research. This contributes to a fundamental level of the capacities and evolution of raw material as an institution, never allowing us to, to rest on our laurels. I mean, I have to say here yeah, that the, the very fact that we call our program Academy is a subversive action. <laughs> because somehow, somewhere, academies are set, are, are meant to, to uh, maintain certain standards and we are definitely here to disrupt those standards. The seminars we are free to be running with Hunter College later this year and next year. We'll build on these things and experiences discussed so far. There will be an invitation to think about curatorial in relation to a place. If we want to strengthen, strengthen the, the pertinence and possibilities of our practice, we must look not only at the great exhibitions of the last century, but at the diverse set of modes of operandi for organizing and narrating creative practice, praxis. How have actors active in our local context and from across the creative discipline disciplines responded to and shaped their environment? How do they collaborate? How do they tell stories and recall history? How do they create sites of possibilities? And how could this impact the type of curatorial work that we do? These questions are a way of framing our commitment to what Senegalese intellectual Felbin Saar describes as epistemology of the sensitive. With this in mind, while in Dakar we will focus on sites and histories that are significant for understanding what the curatorial proposition from Dakar would look like, bearing in mind the epistemologies of the sensitive that we are working with, this same approach will be echoed in New York. Learning from and with practitioners, we use the work to swim deep in the systems of stories of their context. In Senegal, visits and discussion will situate the work of raw material in relationship to its precursors, contemporaries, and the wider context within which it lives and to which it responds. This will also be the opportunity to examine the curatorial and institutional proposition that we are, 
and to understand its genesis and evolution as a response to the realities of the spaces of its conception. So deeply invested in changing pedagogical paradigms, we will take the course beyond the walls of the studio or lecture theater through excursions that help us to get close to the materiality of the place within which our work together will be done. Following a chronological curve, the program will bring the participants into dialogue with researchers, curators, administrators, artists, designers, dancers, thinkers, and daydreamers. <laughs> our time together, through engagement with ideas, people, and places, will serve as a platform for thinking about what it means to use the curatorial as a medium for reflecting from and for a place. Thank you very much.